I think last week I pressed the button, it came on, and I think as soon as I let go of the button, it went off. Um, anyway, heavy construction. And when you think of heavy construction, a lot of times, or in my case, I think of the bulldozer, where you see the side wall of the tire on the bulldozer, and it stands five foot tall on the side wall. And then from the bottom of the tread to the top, it's about 20 foot not bulldozer, dump truck. That's one of those huge Tonka kind of dump trucks that just looks massive, it's impressive, it's cool. And then on an extreme opposite end, if we're talking about construction, sort of, a house of cards. Because what's a house of cards? Something that's gonna come tumbling down if you bump it, if you look at it wrong. What kind of house do you want your family to be? One built like a house of cards? Or one where all the equipment is massive and it's building it designed to last and last a lifetime? So when we think about things, sometimes we get caught up in what we think we want. And we don't take the time to stop and think about what's really important. Because if we thought about it, how do we want that family to be? Do we want it to be like the house of cards? Or do we want it to be a massive structure that's going to hold up against a hurricane? Do we take the time to rightly evaluate where we are in the family of God? So, unfortunately, sometimes... Something can be good sounding and not necessarily soundly good. In Matthew 21, 28 through 32, but what do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. It sounds bad to start off with, but what was the end result? He did what was expected. He did the good. And then continuing, then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? And they said to him, the first. And in the case of this one, the answer sounded good, but the end result wasn't good. Now listen to what Jesus' response was. He said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. He's talking to the priests. He's talking to those that are in the temple, the um, city elders and so forth, the important people. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. So we have the tax collectors and harlots, the crowd that sounds bad. But they repented and they did the good. You've got the chief priests, you've got the elders of the people, and they're the group that sounds like they're the good ones. Except they were unwilling to turn and do the good of God when face to face with the miracles of God. And unfortunately, right actions do not mean a right heart. And okay, when talking about parables and stuff, the parable of the prodigal son sort of sounds like the parable we just read. Because you've got a father and you've got two sons. And one of them sounds off and is doing the nasty. And in the case of the prodigal son, you got the one that goes to dad and essentially says, dad, um, I know you're not dead yet, but I want my share now. Ooh, that's pretty brutal. Uh, I'm not gonna wait till you kick the bucket. I want my goodies now. And he's not even the oldest son. And he takes it off and goes and squanders it all on someplace else. But. While there's a similar part to this message, the one that sounds bad, but does good, and the one that sounds like he's in the good, and then at the end you find out he's in a hurting place, 
it's more than just the issue of the prodigal son. It's the issue of where are the hearts? Because while the first one messes up royal, but what happens? His heart changes. It's not, oh, I need dad to bail me out. Even servants and slaves in my dad's household have food to spare. Better to be a slave under dad than to be here wishing I could be in the pig slop because I can't buy enough with what little I'm getting paid. I'm going to go home. I'm going to repent because better to be a slave in my dad's household after the stupid stunt I pulled than trying to continue where I'm at right now. And he gets it. And the older brother, who's been appearance-wise faithful all along, when his brother comes home, oh man, he gets the party, he gets all the goodies, he gets decked out in the good stuff, gets a ring from dad, and he already squandered the money. What are you doing, dad? You need to be kicking him to the curb. Let him know what kind of no count he was. I wanted my goodies to celebrate with my friends. I've been doing good for you for how long and I got nothing. Woo! He might have looked real good because he was the one doing all the things dad said to do all along. But do you understand the attitude he had toward his own brother? Because one of the things we need to realize here Jesus is intentionally crafting the examples he's given. That first example, a father and two sons. This second example, a father and two sons. Because we get that in that family kind of relationship, how's it supposed to be between the father and the sons? Aren't the sons supposed to look up to and respect and honor? And yet, what do we find? We find the world. Because the truth is, do any of us get it perfectly right? No. At some point in time, we're sitting in one of those two sons' positions. Jesus is letting them know. This isn't just a, I tell you, you do right kind of thing. And it isn't just a, you got to have the right motivation kind of thing. This is a relationship. It needs to go deeper than just doing the right and even thinking about it in a right way. It's about what's in here, commitment and relationally that makes it something more than just, I know to do right, I did the right, and I got a good attitude about it. Then we have misdirection versus a right direction. And okay, there's a subtle bit of mist that's in here, and I'll be honest, I didn't get it until I wrote the sermon. In Matthew 10, 38 through 42, it said, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And okay, we're still dealing with that obedient submission kind of issue. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. And it wasn't until I was working on this that I finally realized the name of the disciple he was referring to. And I was blown away. Because in 57 years of life, I had no clue which disciple he was referring to. And then it finally hit me. Does anybody know the name of the disciple? I'll give you a hint. 
When a father attends church, and this is from last week's sermon, that's why the whole slide thing changed, there's a 93% chance that everyone else in the household will too. When the father is being the disciple he is called to be in Christ and gives the example he's called to give, there will be the right impact. What's the name of the disciple? It's Rich Kelly. It's Robert Bell. It's Joe. It's John. Put your name there. When you, because you are a disciple of Christ, are doing what's right and showing the example to your child, and I'm not talking just biological. I'm talking about children in Christ's spiritual level. When, because you are a disciple of Christ, one who is following his teaching, following his example, take the time to show it to one who's coming up, to one who is just learning and growing and developing. It's your name. You are the one who has the opportunity to make the difference in one who is learning. And they're learning not because you're telling them, but because you're showing them in a way they understand. I'm doing this good because of who I am in Christ. Not because, well, you're my son, you're my daughter, you get the special. Because above and beyond that, you need to understand grace and mercy in terms of God. And unfortunately, there is such a thing as useless religion. James 1, 22 through 27. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, and yes, this was in our men's class this morning. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Knowing right isn't enough. You gotta be acting on that right that you know to do. But continuing, but he who looks in the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. We've got to work to get better for. And it's not just for myself. Who was it for? It's the one I gave the cold cup of water to, the child, who learns through my example what is the right and proper thing to be doing. When each of my kids got to be old enough to be able to drive the car themselves, without me saying or Vicki saying anything to any of them, each one of them volunteered on Thursday to go and fix the seniors meal in Newberry. Tyler did it when he got to be 18. I think that's how old you have to be in Florida to be able to drive without an adult. Um, maybe I got that wrong. I don't remember how old that is. 16. 16. Okay, 16. So when Matthew got to be 16, which was three years later, what's he do? He gets in touch with Jess and says, hey Jess, you need help with the meal? Because Tyler's heading off to college pretty soon. It's like, sure, so Tyler does it. I mean, Matthew does it after Tyler goes on to college. And what does Sierra do as soon as she's able to drive? Same thing. Not because I told him, you need to go do the good. Because of the example they saw again and again and again, it became an ingrained part of who they were. Just like it said about the fathers, if you show the priority, if you show by who you are, they're gonna be listening. They're gonna take it in. 
and in some way you're going to end up seeing how it gets applied in their lives. Remember where we started off. How do we rightly evaluate where we are in God? Part of that is asking, how are we impacting our family? As a father, as a mother, as a sister, as a brother, as a daughter. And I left out, oh, son is there, it's okay. I got in the print even if my brain left it off. As a disciple showing the example. Because that's a big part of what family is. Being the disciple of Christ showing the example. And I did mean it when I put in their son and daughter, brother and sister, because we covered it last week. And you children, obey your parents. Bible isn't just about what the adults do when they're ready to make adult level decisions. The child who does what God asks us to be doing. When the parent is missing it, the parent gets to come face to face with the truth. Wow, that didn't come from me. And yeah, that was right. And it sort of begs the question. That's what it means for a child to be obeying God's word in a way by their example that even their parents have to wake up and listen someday. God will not forget your work if there's something there to remember. Hebrews 6, 9 through 12 says, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you've shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Who has the responsibility? Each one of you. Not the minister, not the elder, not the deacon, not the song leader, not pick your position that you think is all important spiritual. It doesn't say that. It says each. When you are old enough to hear, old enough to understand, you're old enough to realize you're part of that each. And as being part of that each, you need to be diligent in striving to be who you're called in Christ. Because that example is going to resonate with someone. And sometimes it's going to be the person you least suspect is listening, is watching. But if you are diligent, consistent to be that child in Christ, it's going to get heard and it's going to have impact. And then, in case you may not be able to guess it, you're going to see in a moment as to which parable it is. Never doing anything so you never make a mistake is never going to cut it. And I'm talking about the parable of the talents. And that's Matthew 25, 24 through 30. I'm going to cut it a little bit short. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. And I was afraid and I went and hid my talent and I just condemned myself. Because I know you expected me to do something. But I didn't. Because I was afraid. Except. <laughs> I know you expect. And my fear wasn't big enough that I did something. Instead I did nothing. And what does that nothing get? Yeah, I'm going to pound on this one. When fathers attend church it doesn't say when you do the big awesome thing when you do the littlest bit of right and you do it and you do it and you do it 
got mentioned in class this morning. Sometimes we got to remember to do the little things. You know what happens when you do that little thing over and over and over again? If I walked a straight line down the front of the, uh, down the center of these aisles, and I walked in the exact same spot every Sunday, year after year after year, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see that little bitty bit of carpet start to wear out. And if I could keep doing it and doing it, it wouldn't stop at the carpet when the carpet gets worn gone. It would start to work into the concrete. And after a while, that concrete would start to get this rut developed into it. Why? Because by being faithful in what is small, it has really deep, impactful results. That 93% can't be ignored. And it's not just the fathers. Yes, when it comes to attendance, that's what this is talking about. But when the wife is faithful and is faithful and is faithful, how do you move the mountain? One shovel full at a time. You keep doing what you know to do right. Is one shovel full moving the whole mountain? No. But when you keep doing it and doing it and doing it, it has the impact it's supposed to have. When you are faithful. How hard is it to attend? Life's going to test what we're doing and are not doing for our family. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, a straw each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is if anyone's work which he's built on it endures he'll receive a reward if anyone's work is burned he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire if what you build on, on the foundation, is dross, I'm giving God the least I can give. My wife's going to see that. My kids are going to see that. Members of the body of Christ are going to see that. The world is going to see it. I might be doing the barest of minimum, and what's to say I'm going to get out of it? It's going to be shown for what it is. I will get out of it possibly the barest of minimum. What's that? Myself. What's it going to cost me? Everybody else I named off potentially. Because what was I showing them? I wasn't showing them anything. I was showing them actually how little I valued God because I gave him my dross. Some of the people I'm dealing with right now are men who are close to my age, who finally realize, yeah, I need to be getting a clue. I need to be acting the way God has called me to act. I need to step up. If for 57 years you put it on cruise control and Christianity was whatever happened to happen this week, and it wasn't a priority. And you got there if you got there, and if you didn't, it didn't matter. These are men who are sweating because their wife isn't attending with them, or if she is, she's grumping about it. The kids aren't attending with them because, Dad, you've never done this before. I'm not doing the crazy now. This is a waste of my time. Because they didn't. They're in an uphill battle. Uphill battle like nobody's business. It's going to be shown for what it was. But, does that mean you're throwing the towel and just say, forget it, can't do anything? Or do you accept the fact that you're behind the eight ball, but God is the one who can move that eight ball? If. If we're convicted and committed to follow through on what God has called us. 
Does it mean we're going to succeed all the way? No. It means we're called to do what we can as we can. To be that example starting when? Starting now. Because the opportunity to make a difference is still there. If. If we're willing to put our faith in God and act. Because if we don't even put the dross on there, if we are the one talent, I'm sorry, that was a zero, wasn't it? <laughs> if we are the one talent who does nothing with it, what did he say about the one talent man? Take the one talent he's got, give it to the guy that's got 10. Chuck him outside. He is not mine. Dross is better than nothing, and dross is terrifying as far as the consequences it'll yield. We know the difference between working and neglect. Neglect is that bad thing. The neglect is the evil thing. Neglect is what means your kids are taken away from you, or your parents, when they become elderly, are taken away from you, and you're possibly charged with a crime. Because we know in this world, neglect is evil. Same is true for spiritual. The cost is just as bad spiritually when there's neglect. We need to recognize if we don't make family, spiritual family, an intention, it doesn't accidentally just happen and just go right. Like I said, if you neglect to make the effort, pray real hard, because uh, I'm sorry. Based on effort, there's zero hope. We know the difference. I'm closing it out, Romans 12, one through six. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, show to others, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Jumping down to the end, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them in proportion to our faith. God isn't asking for the impossible. Even when it's just the one talent, he wasn't saying, give me a billion back. I gave you one talent because that's what you could handle. And if you take the time to even invest it in the bank and earn interest, that's more than zero back. Take what he's given you and put it to use. How? For God. <clears throat> With your family, invest in family toward God. Because if all you do is invest in family and leave off that toward God part, what do we say is gonna happen if you leave off God? You got nothing. When you invest in that family toward God is when you're going to be surprised that when they get old enough to use their driver's license, all of a sudden they're doing the right. Well, how did they learn to do that? They learned by the example they saw. Toward God isn't just about my own salvation. Toward God is about the impact it's possible to have on family. I, I, <laughs> I was ready to go for two hours on this today because family is that important to me. I didn't know whether or not to come in here with a sledgehammer and just start smacking as hard as I can because family is that important to me. I didn't know to come in here as gentle as I could 
and in hopes that that would be the message that reaches people. I can't express enough the truth of what we've been going over. There's a reason it started out a father and son or two sons. Because Jesus was trying to reach their hearts with the example he gave. There are examples that don't involve family because the message he's trying to convey is when it comes right down to your personal soul, you've got to make the choice and there's no two ways about it. But when it comes down to the impact you can have, he goes towards parent and child. He goes towards husband and wife. Why? Because we can recognize how important our spouse is supposed to be. We can recognize how important our desire is for our kids that they don't end up dead on drugs in some alleyway. Because I can tell you about friends I had when I was a kid who were in church. John Hall's not alive today. He was my friend. I used to go over at his house. My mom would drop me off at the halls. And then John and I would walk across the street to school because mom was a nurse and she was dropping us off before going to work. John, Chrissy, and I were the three kids in class, in Bible class I'm talking about. John died of a drug overdose. The woman he was living with wasn't his wife. He'd had two wives before her. He didn't bother marrying the third one. It takes intentionality to have the long-term impact. Just attending is a good start, but don't let it end there. Life's going to test what we're doing or are not doing for our family. And I mean that in the broadest sense. We need to start acting like family's important. Growing the faith we have with the understanding that God wants family to be good and good toward him. And the truth is, you can't separate those two and have it turn out right. Because when family only means who we are, not who we are, as John said, whose are we? If it's not family in God, it's going to go the wrong way. And it may not be with your immediate, it might be that next generation on. Because the truth is, I'm not doing what I do now just because of Tyler, Matthew, Sierra, and Vicki. I'm doing it because of Chase, Matthew's wife. I'm doing it because of Cheyenne, Tyler's wife. I'm doing it because of grandkids that aren't even here yet or even thought of. Because if I don't do it right as hard as I can now, <coughs> I can't change what's going to come down the road later. The foundation I'm building on is either on Christ or it's not. And take that eye out and put in the right disciple's name. Whose name is that cup given in? As a disciple? Who's the disciple of Christ? Who's the one acting? Or not acting? We make a choice, we make the choice daily to choose to do what we're called to do in Christ or to do for ourselves. The impact comes, the impact we want to have comes when we prioritize our decisions in Christ. It begins in baptism, but it continues daily. If you need to take on Christ in baptism, you need the prayers of the church, welcome to come as we stand and sing.